Hey, Link family, we're so excited. Gather and grow number three. We're coming to you live from Lafayette, Indiana, Life Church, home of Pastor John and Brittany Neal and their great family here, great team. The house is full. Hey, we've got Life Church here today. We've got V1 Church in the house. We've got Relevant Church from Niles, Michigan, and Revelant Church from Grand Rapids, Michigan. We also have some special guests in the house today. We've got Pioneer Church from Memphis, Tennessee. Come on, give it up. We also have in the house a special guest from right here in the area, Innovation Church. And so we're so excited for you gathering together with us, joining us online. It's going to be a great day. We're going to have a great conversation. As a matter of fact, we are in part two of Threats to the Legacy of the Church. And so today, Pastor Mike and Julie Signorelli are with us. They're going to be hosting the panel. But before we get to the panel, get it off, hand it off to Mike. Uh, let me take just a minute, as we always do, and we want to introduce you to some of our Link family. So take a look. seeing salvations, miracles, healing, being baptized in the Spirit, reaching out to the community, but what really gets me going are stories like a guy named Russ, who started coming to our church last summer. He's in his 70s. He'd only been in church four or five times in his life. He was an atheist, didn't believe in God, but for some reason he just kept coming, and eventually God worked on his heart. He got saved. He got baptized. He's serving everywhere every week. He is praying with his wife, and he looked at me with tears in his eyes after one service. He came up to me and he said, Pastor Sean, you have no idea what it's like to get rid of 70 years worth of sin out of the dumpster of your life. I said, praise God. That's what it's all about. I believe there's an acceleration of those stories, and our best days are not behind us, but our best days are yet to come. Mi querida gente de Link, soy José Rea, pastor de Global Ministries, una comunidad hispana que está establecida en la ciudad de Orlando, Florida. Además, tenemos campus en Venezuela, Panamá uh, y, y distintos lugares del mundo, pues tenemos una iglesia online. Y tengo tanto que agradecer a la familia de Link, porque... Eh, si saben, conocen algo de lo que está ocurriendo en mi país, Venezuela, uh, eso nos obligó a mí y a mi familia a emigrar a los Estados Unidos para establecer una iglesia fuerte que pudiese entonces proseguir el llamado que Dios nos estaba haciendo. Y comenzamos que, con una iglesia que nos llamó, pero luego uh, no siguió con nosotros y Lynn, desde ese momento fue esa mano de ayuda y quiero decirles, sin el apoyo de Lynn, nosotros no pudiésemos progresar, no pudiésemos hacer lo que estamos haciendo. Uh, hemos recibido apoyo de todo tipo, entrenamiento, apoyo financiero, apoyo en cuanto a ese acompañamiento que tanto necesitamos los pastores y la familia y el equipo y de lo cual estamos tan agradecidos, profundamente agradecidos. A los que conocen también la situación saben que el COVID golpeó a las iglesias y nosotros no fuimos la excepción, sin embargo allí nos mantuvimos y comenzamos la, la iglesia online. Hoy, hoy día tenemos a, a más de 300 personas en la comunidad local conectadas con Global y a más de 500 personas conectadas en la comunidad online, además los campus, tanto en Panamá como en Venezuela y, y en otros lugares siguen creciendo y siguen avanzando y, y de eso se trata, de eso se trata esa, esa comunión eh, como pastores, como iglesia, podemos apoyarnos, podemos saber que nos tenemos los unos a los otros. Así que una vez más, Gracias por lo que están haciendo. Gracias por el apoyo 
y gracias por la bendición de su compañía. Hey guys, Pastor Clint Sprague here, lead pastor at Life Mission Church. Hey, my name is Jerry, lead pastor of New Tribe Church. My name is Lucas Forstoff. My name is Justin Vaughn. Hey, my name is Blake. Hi, I'm Tim Hobson. And several years ago, we were going through a rebrand. Michael Prasad really helped us capture what we envisioned when we came up with the name New Tribe Church. And he did an amazing job of hearing our hearts, hearing what was in our heads, and helping us to make it a reality. He ended up building a brand new website for us, gave us a brand new logo, rebranded our church entirely. Michael's process was simple. Uh, that would literally reshape how we thought about ministry and how we did ministry. We've seen an increase in attendance, an increase in visitors, an increase in our engagement, an increase in our small groups. Uh, we have grown. Even through this difficult time, we continue to grow. We are really excited about the results that we have. And so I want to encourage you, working with Michael is a joy. The future is bright, and it's all because of Michael's help. My name is Michael Prasad with Church Brand Guide, and I would love to help you brand your church. Well, hello, everyone. We are pastors Mike and Julie Signorelli from V1 Church. Hey, guys. How are you? Come on. We've got a live audience here in Lafayette, Indiana. Let's get real loud. Glad to be here. We're going to have a great discussion, but I want to start by asking a question to all of the leaders and pastors. Would you love to have a church sprawling with millennials, young families filling your kids' spaces? Would you love to see millennials just pouring in? Matter of fact, if you're not a leader, would you love to have Christian millennials who are your friends? Here's another, here's another question. Uh, would you love to see Gen Xers? who have decades of experience in entrepreneurship and leadership thriving in your local church as pillars and just helping out. I, I think all of us would love to see that happen, but we've got a problem. The problem is deconstruction because unfortunately, millennials and Gen Xers are leaving the church in droves. And I've got good news for you. I've got a panel here today, and we're gonna delve into these questions. And I believe that this can be a life-changing experience for every single one of you who are tuning in uh, for this Gather and Grow. Matter of fact, last night I was praying for this event. I just felt like there was going to be an impartation and a release of so many things that you're gonna come out of this and say it was incredibly valuable. Um, but before I do that, let me introduce you to our guests. Our panel is stacked today, and they've got so much wisdom to bring. We're going to start with Muta and Christine from Relevant Church. Uh, they are phenomenal leaders. Come on. Yeah, we can. They're the best. You can shout them out in the chat as Love well. Them. Incredible leaders. And here we are being hosted by the mother and the father of this house. Yes. Here in Lafayette Life Church, yeah. we have John and Brittany, incredible pastors and leaders. Come on. Their building is incredible. Thank you guys for having us. So as I mentioned, one of the most pressing issues of our day is deconstruction. It's very difficult to find a definition online, so I'm going to provide you with one. I know that we have many people taking notes here, so you want to maybe try to write this down. But deconstruction, this is the best definition for what I'm talking about and what we're going to be talking about today. It is critically questioning traditional modes of Christian belief. So critically questioning traditional modes of Christian belief and often refusing to recognize as authority those who are perceived as occupying privileged Christian institutional positions who supposedly, and I'm going to say it like a deconstructing millennial would, <laughs> Speak on behalf of God. So let me just break that definition down in layman's terms for you. Millennials and Gen Xers are struggling right now with traditional modes of Christian belief, church attendance, 
very long-held uh, Christian beliefs, things that the church has, has held true for the last 2,000 years. They're questioning it. They're undermining what they've been taught growing up in the church. And they also are refusing. This is really important because we have a room here and many churches uh, filled right now with leaders, staff members, pastors, and they, the, the millennials and the Gen Xers simply do not view you as an authority uh, to speak on those positions. And so we have a lack of receiving from authority, and we have a lack of belief that what they were told growing up is in fact the truth. So now that I've whet your appetite, and you're probably like, this is okay. good. Yeah, this is gonna be real good. This is juicy. This is uh, <laughs> scandalous. I some like would say. it. Yeah. <laughs> we're going all the way. So we're gonna start with this. Um, because actually the churches that we're highlighting today do have significant millennial and Gen X representation, both in leadership um, and in the congregation. And they've been very successful at this, which is why I want to start with this question and we'll open it up. What are the root issues? Because, you know, we don't want to waste our time with a surface level conversation. Yeah, the symptoms. You know, yeah, the symptoms. It's like someone has a cough and it's cancer and someone has a cough and it's a cold. So let's not deal with the symptom. Let's deal with the roots. Yeah. What are the root issues causing millennials and Gen Xers to leave the church right now? Anybody can take it. Not all at once. Yeah. Volunteers are victims, y'all. Please, please respect each other. Please. <laughs> go ahead, girl. You I'll got start. It. I'll go for it. I think the biggest thing as a millennial myself, I think the biggest root issue is fake. It's not real. It's not, it is surface level. There's no depth. There's no, I know I want real. I want the messy. And I think there's two, that, that's the root is there's not enough real. Come on, that is so good. Yeah, I do think that we've seen a lot of regurgitation of like spiritual things, also a millennial myself, um, where we like see on Sundays digested Christian culture, but like, are they living it at home? with their wife when no one's looking, you know what I mean? So yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback off that. Yeah. I would, uh, actually say that, uh, one of the major things that I've seen so far is for so long in faith and Christianity, we've taught to be countercultural, and we're seeing more millennials and gen Xers actually being more aware of culture and being more connected to culture. And so there's this tension now that's coming that's saying, Hey, how do I be countercultural, but still be involved in my community and connected to the people who I so deeply love, who I work with every single day? And does my faith mean I, I have to shun you or I have to be disconnected to you? And so when that wrestling and that tension comes, unfortunately, sometimes um, the decision is, well, I, I'm supposed to be in this world, but not of it. So I'm just going to go be in the world. And if the church doesn't like it, then... Wow. Well, I think we're dancing around a topic right now uh, that has more deep implications of church hurt because, you know, millennials have seen their friends choose lifestyles that are not in alignment with traditional biblical values. And I, I often feel like they're, they, they have to decide between their, their friend and their church. And so maybe somebody can speak to that because I think a lot of millennials would say, well, I left the church, uh, still believe in Jesus Christ, still, you know, turn up worship music in my home, but I left the organizational structure because there was this root issue of church hurt. And sometimes it's not even, it hurt them directly, it hurt their friend. Does anybody want to speak into that? Like, how, what are the root issues that, that maybe cause millennials to struggle with this? I mean, I, I definitely would go back to what Britt said the first question, I, I would argue that um, the realness of um, wh how we how we respond as leaders to them, um, the the realness that they're getting from us, I think there's I think there's sometimes this high expectation of leaders, right, mm -hmm. um, and this 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 idea that um, we live in a in a way that um, others can't, right? And the idea for me that I believe what people are attracted to right now is just like, man, I got my junk too. I got my flaws too. 
And I've, you know, the reality is I've been hurt by people. I've been hurt by the church, right? But my dad was always so good with redirecting me back to and what I try to do with people all the time um, who are walking away from the church community is like, man, you know, I'm not going to take my bitterness out on Jesus because of people. I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave what God really cares about wow. because somebody gave it a bad taste. Mm. And yeah, I think, I think we live in a world today where, man, you can be broken. You can be a little jacked up, but if you're just real, people, people, people want that. People, people will choose to, to be around that. People will choose to want to, want to stay connected with that. Mm. So good. But also with uh, the whole church hurt, um, just hearing that and talking to people that have said they've been church hurt and sitting down and realizing, is it really the church or somebody within the church that hurt you? A lot of times they'll just generalize it and say, well, I'm done with the church because I was hurt by the church, but not realizing that the church is a body of, you know, a body of Christ. And if uh, a limb hurts you, if it's one limb, it's not the whole body that hurt you. And, um, just talking to people and being authentic with them and letting them realize that it's not general. It's not the whole church. Like they're jumping from church to church. If somebody on my job hurt me, I don't say, oh, well, my corporation hurt me. No, I say directly that person wow. hurt me. And that authenticity and being real and letting people know when they sit down with you and talk, is it a church hurt or you were hurt by one person in the church and you're taking it out on the whole organization? Come on, that is so good. Go ahead. That's good. Okay, so let's go a little bit deeper because we're dealing with root systems. How do you, though, legitimize the church hurt instead of dismissing it or minimizing it? Because I think that's something that a lot of millennials have expressed. Well, my church hurt was minimized or it was uh, delegitimized. So how do we legitimize the church hurt without diminishing that faithfulness to the local church? And how, is there, Do you guys have some insights into that? Yeah, mine is very simple, but... Um even the way that I handle my marriage and that we try to handle hurt in our marriage. Um, I can validate without agreeing. Mm. I can hear without agreeing. I can understand without agreeing. Um, I can totally identify without agreeing. So I think for me, it comes down to that thing of like, am I willing to sit down and listen? Am I just... I don't, I, I, I do not like, matter of fact, I'll use a strong word of hate, uh, mm. making some statement from the stage where uh, people try to capture that in a moment rather than in a conversation that yeah. I'm having with them. I think a lot of stuff gets confused from the stage where it can be clearly uh, validated in a good one-on-one -on -one conversation mm. where people can just express. I don't know if you guys agree with me or not, but I think a lot of times people just want to be heard. They don't even need to be right. They just want to be hurt. Yeah. So I think we live in a world like that. That's where we're at right now. People just, people just want their opinion to be known. Yeah. And I think we just need to get better at having those conversations as individuals and as leaders, as people. Um, yeah. And being okay with not having an answer for it because yeah. as pastors, we want to fix it. And oh, I think, I think we can, I think we can oftentimes minimize by trying to fix and val instead of validating and pointing to Jesus. Okay, you just you you guys are nailing it right. I got to take this even deeper because how do you teach every single Sunday? Faithfully teach the scriptures. How are you this massive organizational leader that's hiring staff members, but then you get into the conversation and you learn how to listen and shift out of those modes? I want to know because I think somebody is having a breakthrough moment watching live right now saying, you're right, I'm constantly, I'm because listen, what helped us most in our marriage is when I stopped trying to fix. I'm, I'm outing myself. But I want to hear, ahead. does anybody here have... <laughs> And, but I think, I think a lot of times people did sit down with the leadership of the church and never felt heard. Because that's, well, you know, I've got 17 years worth of a catalog of sermons I'm drawing from, and I'm going to school you right now. And, I'm, and so how do you switch out of that mode as a pastor to where they do feel, like you said, you're not agreeing, yeah. right? But you are empathizing and listening. How could you shift into that mode? I, I will say, I, I actually watched this in real time. You do this uh, a couple of days ago. We had um, some, can I get real? Can we get real? Hey, I already outed myself, can we so get let's real? go. 
Um, so we had we had a, a church member come to us because this is real, right? We're pastors, and they were ta- telling us, you know, that they were um, gonna, you know, leave our church. And I mean, it wasn't anything crazy, but they gave a list of things that that you know they didn't like. And I think it's very easy for us to be like defensive and not want to listen. But I was listening to you. I watched you. He was on the phone, so this person didn't know. But he was taking notes. And then I watched him call our staff after and say, hey, here's a list of things that I agree and we can do them better. And I was like so encouraged um, that that was happening behind the scenes. Like that's not something that you're typically going to hear about at a conference. Like this person left my church and they were right. You know, typically we're like, yeah, they're jerks and (laughs) we got your back and they're dumb, you know. And so, um, but it's almost like, taking the posture of listening sometimes isn't just listening. It's like, yeah, you're right. Wow. You're right. I am wrong. And, and, and I want to get better. Now, not everything they said was right, but some of it was. (laughs) Well, I tried to see the value in it. I remember telling our staff on that call, Jules, I didn't know you were spying on me, by the way. I was spying. Every good pastor. They're always watching, bro. We're watching, listening, and texting you what to say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I remember actually saying, um, we, we missed it this time, but we can be better for the next person that never sees these deficiencies. Because I think information, when you're a pastor, it primarily comes from the top down, God to you. But understanding that information can come from the bottom up. And sometimes they're not a critic, they're a coach. And I think we view a lot of church hurt millennials and Gen Xers like critics. Yeah. And if we viewed them as coaches, yes, sir. there could be a breakthrough moment there. You've got to learn how to chew the meat and spit the bones. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so I spit a couple of bones. Yeah, you did. But I also was like, guys, there's something here. So yeah, I think we should also be listening ourselves to others who are speaking into our lives. I think oftentimes as pastors and as leaders, we can get to the point where I've heard from God. I know the vision. It's clear as day. And so what you're saying is coming against the vision. And so I don't have to listen to you. Mm. You need to be listening to me. And I think when we put ourselves under submission of other leaders who are speaking into our lives, Mm. we learn how to be empathetic. We learn how to be listeners because they are listening to us and they're giving us feedback. And so when we surround ourselves with a lot of good leaders and people in our lives, uh, especially brothers in Link, you know, some of the fathers in Link, you can't, you can't be a good father. And pastors are fathers. You can't be a good father unless you learn how to be a son. Come on. And so when you learn to be heard, then you'll learn to listen. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, here's seconds. the thing. What, what if the millennials and Gen Xers you can't stand are in fact acting like you? 100%. Because I talk a lot about impartation. I know we talk about that a yeah. lot. It's, it's, all, it's like sometimes the things in your kids you don't like is what you parented into them. They're Absolutely. just acting like you, but they're like the eight-year-old version of you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like everything that I can't stand about my kids is what I did to my parents. Wow. So you shouldn't be in authority unless you're under authority. 100%. This is good. So it's submission good. is the root issue. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah, because when you look at deconstruction, they refuse to submit to authority in the local church, and they refuse to submit to the authority of scriptures. So maybe we do have to, I guess I'm having a convicting moment. We might just do an altar call live here. (laughs) We'll be the first down there. What if it's our lack of submission in our own leadership that is what we're doing conservatively, they're doing extravagantly? Yep. Wow. Wow. what, What James Dobson says, he says, what you do with tolerance, your kids will do in excess. And so as spiritual fathers and mothers in our house as pastors, we need to watch for the trends that keep coming because it could be a sin issue in our life that we need to deal with. Well, I'd like to tackle one more uh, question in this vein because this is bringing so much value. How do we build a, a healthy church in the midst of such unhealthy times? I mean, the mental and the emotional pressure is so great. How do, you build, how, how do you build a healthy church in unhealthy times? Because I think what we're talking about is like, even we have to make sure we're healthy as leaders because we can't have healthy spiritual children if we're not healthy spiritual parents. So 
How, how do we do that? How, do you have any suggestions or insights? If I can just use the word that we started this whole thing off with, like, like God deconstruct me. Hmm. Um, and I think it goes right with what mm-hmm. we've already hit with the submission part. Like David, right? Where he said, man, if there's anything in me, mm-hmm. get it out. You know? So I think it starts with us getting on our knees, like literally, and submitting our hearts very humbly to God with the idea that we don't have it figured out. Reminding ourselves that we do need his grace and his mercy, thank God, wow. every single morning, right? Wow. And then I, th- I would say the next piece would be our families, right? Where anything that needs to be out of our families, you know, and, and the things that we just talked about this, I think, last night, you and I, just the things that um, our kids deal with today that we never had to deal with, you yeah. know what I mean? So I think the healthy part is us continuing to say what we've, what I've said a couple of times is just, man, change me yeah. before you change anybody else. Continue to change me, continue to grow me. Wow. I, I, again, I, I, my dad's been my pastor forever, so I keep bringing him up, but my dad always came back to that for us. It's like, Hey, listen, um, you want a healthy life, you want a healthy marriage, you want a healthy healthy family, it starts with you. Yeah. Start with you, your relationship with Jesus. Wow, so powerful. Jesus and therapy. Those are my two answers. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Sure. Yeah. Hey, listen, I was going to say that uh, in a series that we just preached called You Asked For, we took audience questions, and one of the questions was, hey, um, do I need deliverance or do I need a therapist? I wow. said, yes, both. Yeah, right. Come on. Listen, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take a, a short uh, break from this conversation. I know we're ending it on a cliffhanger, but when we come back, we're going to inspire and we're going to equip you with tangibles. And so if you didn't think this conversation could get any better, you were just in the first half. It's so I juicy. want you to check out this powerful message uh, from a partner and we'll see you on the other side. Hey, Link family, it's Mike Benson from the Conference International Strength Team. We have, for the last 15 or so years, been traveling all over the world, preaching the gospel, and we're currently here in Lahore, Pakistan, well, about three hours outside of Lahore, and we are about to cross the one million mark, one million souls, one to Christ, in the last 15 years of ministry. I know we do it with a lot of your churches and doing community outreach events, evangelism, and we are excited to tell you that we just launched the Fire School of Evangelism, teaching and training and equipping saints to do the work of evangelism in the power of the Holy Spirit. Signs, wonders, prophetic utterance, healing, all the things that the Holy Spirit has placed within every single believer. So thank you, Link family. I love being a part of this family. I love serving in the churches. I love the pastors. I love my pastor, Dwayne. I'm from Granville resident anyway, by the way. So from Pakistan, God bless you. Have a great time. Man, isn't it exciting to partner with ministries like Mike Benson and the Conquerors and just to be able to go outside of our four walls, outside of our nation, and reach the world for Jesus Christ. We want to give you an opportunity. If you want to invest in the Conquerors, we want to invite you to go to our link app, click on Give, and then click on Fund. And in the Fund, you can select Special Projects. And then in the memo, put Conquerors. And everything that you give, we're going to sow into their ministry and allow them to do great things. I also want to mention, Mike uh, spoke about having the Fire School of Evangelism. If you guys want more information for that, you can check out the Conquerors on the website. But right now, hey, we've had a great session one. We're going to have a great session two. So I want to throw it back to Mike and the panel. Come on, I am so excited to jump back into this conversation, but I want to welcome some churches, just some of them who are watching online live right now. Hey guys, get loud where you're at in your own space. I'm so excited that we're all just one family under a digital roof. So I want to shout out Riverside, Victory Life, 
Connect Global. Come on, Res Life, we love you. Holland, Res Life, Holland. <laughs> Maranatha, Resurrection Life. We've got Traverse City represent the Resurrection Life Traverse City location. New Tribe, what's going on, everybody? Northway Christian. We got Rust City. We got Real Life, Pioneer Church. Hope Church, Pioneer Church is in the house. Oh, come on. There they are. Yes. <laughs> Hope Church and so many more. Hey, if I missed your church name, can you drop it in the chat right now so our digital greeters can just welcome you right on in? We're so excited that you chose to spend this time with us. I want to transition into this faith-filled portion because, you know, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace is greater. Does anybody believe that? Amen. And so we just, listen, some, somebody saw a giant and somebody saw big grapes, but they were both looking into Canaan. And so I see an opportunity. The prophet Joel said, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit among all flesh. That includes the millennials who get on your nerves, the Gen Zs who are deconstructed. Am I right? And so I see an opportunity. I see generals rising up in the faith, leading. I see uh, somebody leaving this session filled with uh, not just the spirit of God, but equipped with strategy. So I want to ask a question. We know what, what the enemy's doing. We, we just spent the first half talking about that and dissecting what the enemy's doing. But I want to know now what God is doing. And so what are you seeing God do in the midst of political wokeness? Okay, it got real quiet here in the room. Um, in the midst of political wokeness and deconstruction, all these conflicting ideologies, we're living in turbulent times, but what is God doing in the midst of it? I got something. Come on with it. Yeah, okay, good job. Um, I, I, you know, we're, we're in New York City and we're in the Midwest, so we have two different extremes, right? Uh, we're also in Long Island and Brooklyn, which are also two different extremes when it comes to political ideologies and how people prescribe or whatever. So um, we kind of live in that tension all the time as pastors. We're not in a we're not in a, a red county. We're not in a blue county. Like we're it's just like a hodgepodge of everything. And um, what I've seen, I, just to inspire you and to tell what God is doing, is people who had almost an identity in one camp or another, I've seen them come to us in tears and say, you know what, I'm laying it down for the cause of Jesus. I, this is no longer a personality or this is no longer like something that I'm going to ascribe to as, as my identity. My identity is a son and daughter of Jesus. And so we've seen that in the city. We've seen that. And it's been so beautiful. Um, and I just want to say like, God is doing something special. Yeah, there's deconstruction, but when, when, when Jesus's body was resurrected, there was a truth that went out and a lie that went out. And right now deconstruction is the lie. Wokeness may, might be a lie, but I'm seeing people who are sold out for Jesus and who are not woke, but awake. Yeah. yeah. So there is encouragement out there. Come on. That is so, so good. good. You know, I, I, Honestly, once I was talking to my wife about this, is like I want to redeem the word woke. Yeah. Yes. I think it, what you just said was so true, Pastor Julie, because at the end of the day, being woke is just being awakened. And that's what we're seeing happen. Uh, very similar to you, we have a very diverse church, just like you guys, diverse uh, economically, yeah. socially, age, you know, uh, politically, and racially. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happening, people are awakening that these party lines that they've drawn yeah. are no longer sufficient yep. to contribute to their depth and growth and their understanding of who God is. Mm -hmm. You know, they, yep. they can't be limited on either side. And so I, I'm telling you, I like the word woke. Yeah, let's get woke. Let's get woke to the realities of, right. hey, we all need to learn and grow and get yes. beyond the other side. In so fact, true. we love saying we love across boundaries, right? Yeah. And then with de deconstruction, you know, what I love about deconstruction, and it, again, it's it's gotten a negative connotation because we love we love using words and phrases to pit people against each other. You know, yeah. a lot of marketing people have been paid a lot of money to pit people against each other based off yeah. of words. Yeah. What I love about deconstruction yeah, is now I'm seeing a lot of Gen Zs and millennials no longer holding onto the faith of their parents. 
they're making their faith their own. Yeah. That's good. So when they sit yeah. there and they tell me and say, well, you know, I, I'm going through this deconstruction. I'm saying, great. Yeah. That means you are going to be awakened to the realities yeah. of God by yourself, yeah. not Amen. based off of anybody else's faith. So and good. so I trust God is big enough to Come bring on. people into yeah. the knowledge yeah. and work of Jesus Christ. And so... Call it deconstruction, call it uncovering your faith, call it whatever. Just get to know Jesus and be changed Jesus. in his That's name. Right. Come on. That's right. Hey, That's so don't, good. I mean, don't you guys agree that maybe God is even screaming to the church, wake up? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because with what you just said, Muda, like, I think the reality is, is that there's some things that we've been doing for a while that, you know, I think I've asked myself some questions of yeah. like, am, are we just doing this? Cause this is what we did in church, like mm-hmm. growing up, like, or is there some real meaning behind this? Uh, I think it wakes us all up. I think it wakes us up yeah. to the idea that God is God, that he will always be God. Lord. It wakes us up to the idea that we have room to grow and we will yeah. always have room to grow. Um, and it wakes us up and reminds us that God has an awesome way of breathing life back into dead things. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come and on. that what the enemy meant for evil, God always has good in store. Yeah. yeah. So I would say wake up to the reality that there's never been a greater time in our lifetime for us to represent Jesus in a really great way. It's really simple right now. You don't have to be very Christ-like <laughs> to stand out. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> Seriously. So true. So true. John, that is so good. You know, Satan is a counterfeiter and God is a creator. We've had two Muslims accept Christ and they're ba- you know, they came to get baptized and we're discipling them. And I, I realized, Muta, while you were talking that they had to deconstruct Islam to accept Christianity. And so I wonder what, with what you were saying earlier, John, is it, we're not anti-deconstruction. It's let us be a part of the process. Absolutely. Let everything that's not true fall. Yeah. But then let's go on that journey together. I see a discipleship opportunity. You know, somebody thinks that they're deconstructing, but it's like, shouldn't we be willing to let go of the traditions and uh, religion of man to embrace the real? Right. And so it's like, let's go on the journey together. I keep thinking about how Jesus said, come follow me. And I think for a lot of pastors, it's come attend my stuff. And so is it come follow me while I'm on a journey or come attend my stuff? And I think what the millennials and the Gen Z's are rebelling against is attending programs. But I do think they're on a journey. The difference is, will we walk that journey with them? And so here's what I want to do, because this is so rich. The Reformation was deconstruction. Yeah, Yeah. it was. Yeah, exactly. So there's an opportunity to embrace Well, I also think, too, how something's not cool once your parents do it with you. (laughs) And so I think probably the dirtiest move we have in this place is that, yeah, let's deconstruct together. Yeah, I'm struggling with some uh, questions, too. Let's in like you make a Bible study out of their deconstruction. And then all the millennials are like, it's not even fun anymore. (laughs) It's not even rebellious. We just got woke with Pastor Muta and I don't want to be woke anymore. Mission accomplished. So let's do this because I want, I want to, we've inspired, we've, we've, you know, told you some inspirational stories. I want to equip now. Let's bring it all the way down from the 40,000 foot perspective down on the ground level. This is a local church pastor, these local church staff members and leaders. What can they leave today and implement and do and try and experiment with, with Gen Z's or I'm sorry, millennials and Gen Xers? I mean, I would say if I could speak to pastors right now, especially creative directors and worship pastors and those particular, because I think that it's, it's deconstructions poaching them faster than any of the other ones, is do not compromise the word of God. Sure. People are using the phrase unlearning. We don't have to unlearn the Bible to relearn the Bible. Yeah. The Bible is his word. And even though you might be tempted to say, we'll make a compromise here or a compromise there, or this person's struggling with identity, I'm going to throw them on the platform, they'll figure it out. It's like, no, you better pause. You better pause. You cannot compromise biblical standards. If people are on a journey, that's okay. The Holy Spirit's got them. You don't have to give them a title to keep them in. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so that's my practical. Come on, some more practicals, just some tools. One of the things that I've observed is that you, what, you have to become a better listener, yes, but also they sense the lack of conviction on what you're saying. Yeah. 
If you don't believe it, they don't believe it. And so I've started to preach unapologetically in New York City Mm -hmm. and often weeping, saying, I actually believe this. And there's something about that, I think, that inspires. Because a lot of deconstruction is the feeling of you're on sinking sand. And they're looking for leaders who are on a firm foundation. And so I would just, your practical is get on a firm foundation if you're not, because now you have something they don't. Isn't that what leadership is? I'm going to take you somewhere you wouldn't go on your own. And so take them to certainty because they're in uncertainty. Uh, Go on that journey. So just a few more practicals with the last few seconds here. Mine's really quick and easy, but Jesus was full of grace and truth. And I say this all the time, like full of grace and truth. He wasn't 50-50. And I think we fall into that category even as leaders. where We're 50% grace when we need to be 100% truth. Or vice versa. Wow. Says he was full of grace and truth. He's 100% grace and 100% truth. Wow. So for me, and I, I'm not shocked by the idea, especially with Jesus, that grace came first. Mm-hmm. So I think the grace of loving people, being gracious with their, with their journey, but also not backing down from the truth. Because there's a lot of things that I'm willing to learn and grow in, but there's some things that I, ref- that I cannot change wow. my mind on what I believe. Yeah, come on. I love that. 100% grace, 100% truth. Any other quick practicals? Just, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, doing life. As leaders, doing life with other others. Yes. Um, a lot of times they see you up front, they see you teaching, they see you preaching, and then they don't see or hear about your real life outside of the church. And so um, doing life with people, allowing them into your life. That's not the That's whole good. church, but you know. I love that. I love that because a lot of times, sometimes we want to retreat, you know, because pastors get church hurt too. No. Yeah, <laughs> true. Right? Yeah, it's true. Yo, yeah. mine is like really simple and extra, extra practical for all the pastors out there. Preach Jesus, not your political position. Yes. Why don't you say that again? Yeah, because yeah. knowing the enemy, the internet went out for 15 it did. seconds. It did. <laughs> When that, we, you know, we're we going to say it again. Like Listen, <laughs> you know, we understand we all have convictions. At the end of the day, everything that has just been said, you don't have to give up your conviction. You don't have to give up biblical truth to preach the word of God, to, to, to uh, acquiesce to culture or to allow people to sit in your church. Pastor Mike just said he preaches truth and they're still showing up because people are looking for conviction. Conviction. They're looking for Holy Spirit filled Bible preaching preachers and leaders, but they don't want to hear your politics. They don't want to hear your stance on certain things. Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. So preach Jesus. Come on. I want to extend off of that. I've noticed that there's a transition in the body of Christ. What happened 10, 15 years ago was, you know, with your sermon, how much can you connect with people through stories from your own life and things of that nature? Illustrations were really big. I love doing all that stuff. But people have a hunger for the word like never before. Millennials actually want to know the Bible. I think one of the biggest contributing factors to deconstruction is actually them having access to Google. And then Google says, well, the Bible contradicts itself but they were never taught maybe it doesn't and here's what scholars believe and so I think it's not that the average intelligence has changed it's the access to information has changed and so people who normally wouldn't seek an intellectual side are now on Google like well how do I answer my friend who says I don't believe in this because what about the gospel accounts not being you know not corroborating the same story and blah 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 so here's a practical we debuted a 101 201 3 one. And we said, we are going to hit all these questions head on. And we are going to actually teach you the Bible, not, not tell you stories about my daughters every week, but like, this is, you know, cause that gets old after a while, but here's the Bible. And that's how I preach on Sunday. I read almost the entirety of Acts chapter 19 last Sunday. And like half of my sermon was reading scripture and just taking them through it. And I don't think I would have done that 10 years ago. But uh, then we, in addition to changing my preaching style, to be just more rooted directly in scripture, we opened up these deep Bible classes. Over 150 people signed up for each one. And I was telling the teachers, I'm like, there are churches this size 
that are just in our groups to learn the Bible. And what we're doing is repositioning ourselves as the authority because that's what they did. They don't believe we're the authority because they're saying, well, you're not a Bible authority. You just tell stories about your family. So it's like we're repositioning ourselves. No, there is depth to us. So I want to challenge all the pastors and communicators. There's now an outlet for that depth. And you, it's actually a very challenging time, but it's like a huge opportunity. And they might be like, Pastor, I didn't know you had this side. I love this. Let's do this. Let's go deeper and, and get excited about it. Hey, was, what, oh, God. Oh, God. oh, come on. Now no, I just, know it's getting good. Go ahead. No, go just ahead. What, what you said on that, and I felt like uh, there may be a little bit of clarity that I, I need to give. So let me give you an example, exactly what you just said yeah. about preaching the Bible, right? So uh, again, we did the series uh, you asked for, and there was a question on abortion, right? Mm. Where do we stand? Are we pro-life? Are we pro-choice? Whatever. So what I decided to do, I, I am all about saving our babies all the way. However, what I said, what, when I preached is I didn't bring any statistics. I didn't bring any, anything that we would usually bring to prove like we've, all these babies have been murdered. I didn't preach any of that. I just preached the Bible. And so many people who were pro-choice in my church came up to me and says, finally, I get it. Wow. Because wow. it was just the word of God. <laughs> It's right. just the word of God. Yep. I, don't, I don't need to bring uh, sociological, yeah. you know, statistics to prove God's word. You preach the Bible and people get conviction. Yeah. That's it. Come on. So good. This is so good. That's good. <laughs> Come on. Do you feel equipped? Yeah. yeah, I feel equipped. Any just more practical opportunities in the midst of this? You know, I would say for pastors, if you feel like a fish out of water in this area, like, oh man, I want to talk about it. I don't know if I can. I don't, I don't know if I'm equipped or, you know, I feel, I don't know, afraid or whatever. Those are real feelings. I've had those feelings. You know, there are different things that have came up over the last few years that as a pastor, I was afraid to step into or speak to. I felt like I wasn't, I didn't know enough or, you know, I knew too much or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, I want to encourage you that in every generation, there's always a questioning movement. Um, you know, 10 years ago, there was like the emerging and the emergent yeah. church. Remember all of that? And then, you know, 10 years before that, it was all of the, you know, um, uh, the Tim Baker scandal. I mean, there, you know, it just there, we just go in waves of, of people being mad at the church. Like, that's normal. In another 10 years, there'll be something else, and we'll call it TikTok. We'll name it something different. Um, so don't be scared of it. And I will say, don't miss the revival that's happening in Gen Z for the deconstruction that's going on with millennials. Don't get too distracted with all the questioning and all of the people who are trying to understand why we have a worship service and why does the music get loud and why, why, why. Don't get distracted with that for the Gen Zs that are going after Jesus with their whole heart. We are seeing this and we're seeing these young people come in hungry. So don't get too distracted with one and miss the other. I want to say something prophetically right now because I, I, it's crazy how you stepped in that direction. What we've been observing is the millennials have children now and the grandparents who are rooted in the faith are taking their grandchildren to church. Yes. So here's what's happening, I, and I'm That's speaking prophetically. Doing. I believe that the millennials are watching from a distance right now. They're, they're going through this, this phase. But I feel like what the Lord showed me is that you actually have the, these grandchildren with their grandparents, and there's a generational gap of millennials. And when the millennials step in, it's going like to be like a spine where the vertebrae just clicks into place, and the body is going to start running. And so, like, we're right there. It's so close. Like, we've been experiencing revival. We're seeing this stuff happen. But it was primarily Gen Z and even the younger generation, which I think is alpha, because we have kids with their grandparents parents coming for prayer, weeping, receiving the Holy Spirit, just powerful moments. Once that generational gap is, is that's what I think is at stake. If you're like, why was this conversation one of the most important we could have? It's there's clicking the generations in place for to see a massive movement. I think, I think this, we're right there. So I just want to speak that prophetically to give everybody hope uh, for what we're going to encounter. 
So um, what I'd like to do right now, unless anyone wants to throw out one last thing, I is uh, <laughs> I want to draw us to a place of prayer. Let's be practical. Prayer has always worked. And so if you ever get to the place where you become more of a strategist than a prayer warrior, you'll be out of the game. <laughs> My greatest strategy comes from intimacy with the Father, right? And that worked two, thousands of years ago. It still works today, right? And so we're going to take a moment right now, and we're going to step into prayer together. And we're going to pray. We have millennials re represented uh, here on the stage. We're going to pray for that generation that seeds were sowed long ago that are going to come up due and come up out of the soil of their heart in this season, and we're going to see it click in. So could we all do that? Especially there's a huge opportunity with every single church represented that's watching live right now. So can we do that? Yes. Can we all come together and pray? Now, don't listen to me pray. Come on. Pray with me as I pray. Can we do that? Okay, because I, I don't want one person active, everyone passive. I, I believe that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Um, I believe that strongholds come down. I believe that as we begin to speak and declare and release things, um, atmospheres shift, chains are broken. And I'm just going to say this, prodigals are coming home. What if the greatest leaders in the body of Christ are going to be millennials who get restored? And, uh, you know, they, it's funny because what do they call the millennials? Influencers. And so who are they going to influence when they click in? That's who's coming. So let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray all together at every church across every location. Heavenly Father, we just thank you in advance for what you're doing. God, we know that you've never been confused. You've never been without a plan. And God, I just thank you that you are releasing strategy, wisdom, insight, revelation, God, that generations will not be lost. God, we thank you that, gen, that the, uh, the Gen Xers and that the millennials belong to you, God. And I thank you that as they go on this journey of deconstruction, the only thing that they're shedding off is religions and traditions of men. The only thing that they're shedding off is lo doctrinal lies. And Father, I thank you that this journey is leading them right to you, just like Saul on the road to Damascus. God, I thank you for a generation of millennials and Gen Xers like they're on the road to Damascus. They don't even know it, God, but they're persecuting you, Jesus, and you're going to confront them directly. And th I thank you for just, God, just signs, miracles, and wonders, and healings, and deliverances, and I thank you for therapy, and trauma therapy, and counselors who are guided by your spirit to speak into trauma and wounds, God, and, and I just thank you for, last thing I want to pray, and I feel this strongly, is that we really need to pray against idolatry. People make idols out of their own pain, and they worship before their own pain, and so, Father, I thank you that idolatry is coming down, connected to woundedness and hurt and pain, God. And Lord, that the cross is enough. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for healing and restoration in Jesus' name and across every single campus and location here in Lafayette, Indiana. Can somebody just shout an amen? Come on, we can do better than that. Amen. Amen. All right, Pastor Bobby, I'm going to cut back to you. Amen, amen. Man, what a great conversation today. I tell you, I, I, I really, I, I'm coming away with some great hope and expectation that, you know, the church has always triumphed. And I believe the church is going to triumph even in this day and in this hour. And here's what I want to say to you. You are a part of the church. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, a lot of times we address some things to senior pastors, but you know what? You're a senior pastor. You're a senior pastor at work. You're a senior pastor in your home. You're a senior pastor with your friends. And God's called you with a word of reconciliation. And God's going to use you to help reconstruct the deconstructed. Yeah. Amen? And so be, be bold, be strong, flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These signs will follow them that believe. And if there's one thing that I see the Holy Spirit doing in this day and hour is He's reawakening, in one sense, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word of God as it changes lives and transforms people. So be bold, be strong, and go after it and see the kingdom of God extended and, and increased. Hey, we've got some great events that we have coming up. For our senior pastors, 
I want to encourage you, if you haven't registered for the Senior Pastors Retreat, this Friday is your last day. And it's my understanding we only have five or six rooms available. So if you haven't jumped on board, you got just a few days to do that, okay? Also, our next Gather and Grow. Haven't these Gather and Grows been awesome? And thank you. I want to thank uh, Life Church for hosting this event, and it's just been a great environment here, great energy in the room. Our next one is going to be August 23rd. We're going to be coming to you from Life Mission in Olathe, Kansas, a suburb, of, a suburb of Kansas City, and uh, Life Mission with Clint and Mary Sprague and their team. We're going to be talking about how to focus your church to be a missional church. And so it's going to be great uh, conversation, and that's August 23rd. And then lastly, I want to mention our LINK conference, September 21st and 22nd at Resurrection Life Church in Granville. It's going to be phenomenal. And remember, it's not really a conference, it's a family reunion. And so we want to invite you and your family, your team, to come and be a part of that. We're going to have a great two days together. We've got awesome speakers, awesome breakouts, and things of that nature. Now, before you go, you have a few minutes left here in your lunch hour. We uh, have some questions that we've kind of thrown out to each of our campuses. And so we'd love for you to take just a minute with your team uh, kind of go over maybe one or two of those questions, talk about them, and if you want to continue to pray for our nation, uh, be sure and do that as well. We're going to be coming back to you August 23rd, but until then, know we love you, we're for you, and we're excited about being a part of Link Family.